All right, let's continue on with the Bravo. Um, I'm sorry, this chapter was so long that we had to break this in two parts. So let's begin part two here, which I think was we left right after the adjournment of the Order of the Nightwalkers. Um, <clears throat> and so we get back to Sam coming coming back and um, here he has, uh, here we hear that, you know, it's Pate, Pate's night with the candle and, but he is, uh, he swaps with Sam and Sam pulls a little ruse where he swaps with everybody for a day so he can use the candle kind of continuously for many days in a row. I mean, we, we kind of heard that he was in, sneaking in on Leo's night and then he, he agrees to swap with, with Pates and Alaros and Robert so you can have a, a pr and then have a pretty good stretch. Plus there was his own night. Um, so he's, he's, he's been at the candle at least five, five nights in a row. Um, and so we find out that Pate is, is reading Archmaester Kilsibs, an appendix of feathers and account of Ravens in Westeros during the reign of King Viserys, second of his name. This actually came from a submission. Um, they had a, a reason why, this particular book uh, would be interesting to Pate as a, as as Jockin as a faceless man, um, and uh, so yeah, put it. Thought it was just you know the names of various books is always kind of fun to throw in, and and yes, this this might be useful later if um, if uh, when we get into eventually the faceless men's mission and what Jockin is doing and everything. I th I think we. If you've watched my videos, you you know that I think that Jockin um, has and the Faceless Men have been hired with Blackfire money, and Jockin is, pr I you know I think that the most logical explanation is that Jockin is looking for Blood Raven, and that's why he wanted to get to the Glass Candle so to help him find Blood Raven. But um, and so this you know it somewhat relates to things, and we'll we'll eventually get into that. Um, <clears throat> and so Sam doesn't care that he's swapped with everybody and he's promised them, uh, um, the same, the same night in return. Um, so they're all going to be angry, but it doesn't matter because he's going to try to save Gilly tonight. <clears throat> and so he, um, and then we just get some, uh, some slowdown here to get into Sam's head and, uh, and finally, we get kind of a background on what happened with the White Raven. And so, you know, we get this we get this obsession with with Gilly and everything he misses about her, her dark hair, her brown eyes, her nonsense songs, the way she smiled. Um, the nonsense songs is something from A Feast for Crows. She seems to know a nonsense song that she sings to Eamon to try to cheer him up that she learned from one of his one of her sisters. Uh, I think down the line, it perhaps might not be a nonsense song. We have to, we haven't just figured out. I haven't figured out like what exactly that song is, but um, I think it'd be pretty fun if Gilly's nonsense song was not so nonsense. Um, and so yeah, the uh, Sam feeling strong with Gilly. This is a lot. This is a lot to do with uh, how Sam feels in a storm of swords and stuff like that when he feels so strong. To, to mess with the, the election and everything. A lot of it has to do with him feeling strong because of Gilly. And so, um, but now she's gone and he's weaker than ever. And so then we get into the flashback to um, the Jon Snow conspiracy and his death. And we, we don't go into the specifics of things too much, but, you know, the idea is that Sam was with, um, fit with Clytus because, you know, they're both failures and cravens and similar um and he finds out that there is a conspiracy and that bowen marsh is at the head of it and that it involves the strong wine that um john is was drinking in in john 13 a dance with dragons <clears throat> colitis drip bruises on strong bruises own strong wine not from the kitchen that hob would be brewing and so the idea is that john is drinking wine in that la on that last day before he's he stabbed, so it'd be neat if part of the conspiracy was actually he was drugged by Clytus or gave him strong wine. This would be a uh, a parallel back to a Game of Thrones when Cersei gives stronger wine to um, <clears throat> um, 
to Robert. What's funny is I think I had a fan actually ask George R. R. Martin whether or not Clytus had um, brewed strong, stronger wine and was and had drugged Sam. And George R. R. Martin gave him a look like, "What? What? What the hell are you talking about?" No, <laughs> like, um, so who knows whether George thought of it or not? I think it's really quite cool. I mean, a lot of time is spent into establishing that Clytus is, brews his own wine and John visits him while he's brewing his own wine. The fact that the wine wouldn't appear in the story again is is silly, you know? I mean, maybe George didn't plan it, but why spend the time on the on like going to see Clytus and brewing his own strong wine? It's just a, such a random thing to include in the story for no reason. Um Anyway, and then this idea is that, you know, that perhaps the, the giant was part of it, too. Um, I think perhaps the, the full distraction is that, yeah, they they uh, they drugged John and they would somehow um, get the, get the giant very angry. I think maybe taking the dead bodies from the ice cells and dressing them up in front of uh, in front of the tower would certainly freak one one out. And then um, that could be the situation. <clears throat> and so Sam was unable to help because he's he didn't he wasn't very good with the glass candle at that point, and so he just watches the whole thing in horror and sees his best friend um, um, get stabbed. Uh, you know, we hear about the pink letter here. Clytus at least resealed it, so we we still don't know who who wrote the pink letter, but we know that Clytus at least read it and resealed it, and that's why there's the smear of pink wax on it. Um, because Clytus was reading all of the mail. And so then <clears throat> Pate agrees to help. And uh, they go into, of course, Pate is the student underneath Walgrave. He takes care of Walgrave. And so he is in the in the Ravenry's, Ravenry's West Tower. And that's where Pate lives as well. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> so it wasn't really that, that difficult for them to sneak up into the rookery. But Pate is the one that's going to have access and so they put in that John beware Marsh beware wine this you know gets back to everything it's going to get back to the prologue where we hear about John uh, John beware we get back to you know the, the Ravens uh, also said like uh, Marsh and and uh, uh, wine in the area Hota chapter and then when we got to to John Connington he thought it meant beware wine and so he like stopped stopped with the wine treatments and and caused the entire company not to uh not to use wine um and the uh the beware march um he thought they were talking about uh um it, it spoke out and, and about marching to storm's end and um so it all comes together the 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 white raven oh and uh the bear white john also went to a lane right yeah they also said um up there too but this is why there were there were ravens all around westeros is because sam was trying to alert john snow and so all of the johns all of the john all of those messages make sense now um finally um and when it returned he guessed the whole story john cried john john it makes no matter you know um but it didn't get there in time and so Marsh's plan goes forward and he sees his friend die. And so Sam is very sad. Um, I think earlier, does he say he, he thought of John and John's last command? Did I miss that? Um, that might've been earlier when um, he dreams of the he dreams of John. John's last command is to take care of Gilly, um, which which Sam fails to do. But that was uh, a big a big kind of sticking point. Um, so he uh, Sam feels like a failure. He can barely lift his sword. Meek words inspire no one. He's a craven, but with the glass candle, he could save them all. And you gotta you know kind of get into Sam's head about how intoxicating this glass candle would be, how powerful one would feel if you're someone like Sam. Now you can do everything. How you can be the Bravo. Um, and so he you know he wants to save them all. And so we list kind of the the important things to to um, to Sam. So we start with Gilly. 
Heyman Battleborn, her son, you know, obviously the babe. And then the true son at the wall. So it all kind of relates to Gilly at first. I mean, then we transition to the sisters, Nella and Daya and Fernie, who we heard about um, at, the, at the order, at the meeting of the order. And so he would want to save them. And then we care of Desmara and Meryl, problems with the Ironborn. We're kind of going. And then he's like, well, I want to save his friends as well. Pip and Gren, Totter and Halder, Ed and Hob and Darian. Of course, Darian's actually already dead, but he doesn't know that. All of the Black Brothers, even Alistair Bloody Thorn. He doesn't actually know that Alistair Thorn is off-ranging. Um, you know, I don't think he would know, but... What's funny is he transitions Alistair Thorne into his father because they're both abusive, similar characters, macho and, son, uh, and, and such. I don't think Alistair Thorne is nearly as evil as Randall Tarley, but um, they're, you know, they're jerks. <laughs> they're big jerks. Um, um, and so plus, but it is kind of like the direction of things right he goes from one abusive father to another abusive kind of mentor who who would have let him die probably you know through training just pushing him and having people beat him to death every day um then he, but that transitions to his mother and then dickon and tala he uh sam has some other sisters so he just kind of named them ramona and cornelia um i don't know why those names came to me ramona quimby probably and cornelia Cornelia, I think I was thinking of Cornelius from um, from Planet of the Apes and it just being an old, old timey woman's name, Cornelia. Um, and then it's like, well, if we're helping all them, then we go to like John's uncle, Benjamin. Of course, you try to self save him. His sisters, Brandon Ricken, who we met, Joe Janemira and the giant poet, boy called Hodor. And then we don't know about Gren's brothers or Pip's sisters, but they just seem like they'd be, you know, things to people to save. Um mainly because you needed to fill it up. Like, why would he jump to, like, the old bear's son? You know, which is, of course, Jorah. Grand's brothers and Pip's sister, the old bear's sons, Stannis and the dread woman, the wildlings and the small folk, the knights and the lords and the septers and the maesters, the boy king Tom and John Connington as prince, even the dragon queen Daenerys, the whole damn kingdom, the whole damn world. He would save them all. But Gilly first. Um, yeah, a very, very passionate uh, scene that I, I like quite a lot. And then we get into um how the glass candle kind of functions and this is in many ways based on Vermeer's six skins and how he describes um being free from his body at the end of the prologue you know and he describes being like an animal in the in the sky like a bird so you know in a sense it's like he was got you know seeing himself first i think is part of it and then in the same way here like sam sees himself sees the 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 novice in a chair te tears rolling down his fat cheeks and then he was aloft uh, uh gliding on a winter's gale above the world a hawk and eagle a dragon you know this is i think there's similar similar language in in the prologue of of, of a dance of dragons and then and then we go on a on a trip from Old Town to Lice. And if you go through, you pass by Starfall. So the Pale Stone Sword rushes by. The Sands of Dorne. The Scourge. The Scourge is one of the green blood rivers. On the Stepstones. And then he's out at the island of the sea. And then all at once he's upon it. And um, gliding through the souls. And he's the people. And he's elated. This is very similar to how Varamir was, was, was thinking. But it's a, it also has kind of a song for Leah kind of feel to it being like all of the people um then we're just you know a few moments of of things that are you know moments of life that might you know be beautiful um men at a table bathed in moonlight laughing at a friend's jest the moonlight there because of you know the moon and the glass candle working that way a dozen children waiting on a street corner their stomach em empty a sad one two women gazed in each other's eyes in love a father touched his son's hair an old man reread his own his favorite book, yeah. The warmth, the hate, the beauty, all of this, and then he searches how he would be like. How does the the functions of the of the of the candle like searching through everyone to to find the the person that you're looking for? It's like sand cascading through your fingers, um, and then and then he feels the the shock of cold, um, which were kind of that that shock of cold is kind of directly from under siege. Um, 
the the time traveling dwarf when he travels to Finland, he all of a sudden is is shocked with cold, and we're not you're not sure if the cold is the transition um, to the new body or if it's the cold because they're in freaking Finland, you know. So it's um it's the same here where he's like you know he's it's night it's and so it's cool out. He just feels the cold, and then we jump to the adventure of Dahan, which. Um, Oh, this took a long time, but uh, so we, you know, we get into Dahan, and he has a little necklace of of the um, of the pale child kind of hanging around his neck that that feels warm, and so he knows that Dahan is with him. But the back one's with him, and he guides him. He's he's looking at the moon, um, thinking about God because that's just how the 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 the, the um, glass candle works. It bounces off the the moon. Um, and I knew you know we needed to really kind of like. It's very disorienting going into a new character, a new place. So it's like we need to have it all be be very simple. We know that this is a rescue and it's going to involve the smuggler, the singer, the alchemist, the fishwife. And so we kind of go into this story of of his 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 adventure party and how he comes about upon them and why they're all useful. And so first he's got to get the money, which Sam had already mentioned, like had already thought way back when he was walking with with um uh Robert, that how is he going to get the money? Well, he's going to go try to lend it. And so we we have a Silvio Regare. The Regares are from Fire and Blood as a big family that used to lend money. Um, uh, in fact, um, Viserys, Viserys the second was married to a Regare. No, maybe I'm maybe I'm confusing. No, she's from. Uh, Try to remember if there was actually a Rogare um, married in. Um, yes, Lara Rogare named married Viserys the second, but yeah. Um, <clears throat> And so they're they're of course they were according to, according to Fire and Blood as big as the Iron Bank of Bravo. So it's just a little history there, but now their fortune is a ruin because they the other rival families brought them down. Um, and then with a Valyrian blade named Truth at his throat, this is kind of funny because so in Fire and Blood, yes, House Rogari does have a Valyrian blade named Truth. Um, but part of the religion of Bacalon is you follow the truth in the way. And so it's very funny that like he's got truth to his th throat, tell, you know, asking him to speak truth and vow to repay this loan. But, you know, Dahan has his own truth of his religion. And if you don't, um, if you don't know to follow of Bacalon, you don't have a soul. Now, this... um. So he lied wide-eyed and unflinching effortlessly. The Regarius did not follow back on, therefore had no souls. It was as if he promised, uh, made a promise to a cow, a deadly cow, admittedly, with a sizable herd to do its bidding, but no true man. Now, the one of the major plot points of N7 Times Never Kill Man, where Dahan character comes from and the pale child Backlon comes from, is that uh, into that religion, they believe that only... The followers of Bacalon, the children of Bacalon, have souls, and so they come in this alien world. And the Jainshi are this, you know, very intel, you know, a very intelligent other race, but they're not humans, and so they feel that they don't have souls, and therefore they can be killed. And there's a lot of discussion about whether or not they um, they have souls or not. And what's funny is that. They never actually bring up the issue of what about other humans that don't follow back on. Um, that's left ambiguous, but it's of course this this big metaphor for um, you know expansionist cultures and expansionist religions, how they believe that like the infidel isn't a real person and therefore the infidel can be killed. Um, and this ha this happens all the time. Like you know if you're if you're not if you're not on the if you're not part of the the in group, you can just you, you you don't have a soul. You don't. It doesn't matter. And so the the point of N Seven Times Never Kill Man is to is to just show this this fact for its ridiculousness. 
you know, that they would not believe that the, the Jane she had souls, but, you know, when they're, they're clearly an intelligent race, you know. And, um, so this is part of it. Like Dahan, Dahan is ridiculous that he doesn't think that anybody else has a soul. So he can do whatever he wants. He can be as immoral as he wants, essentially. It's funny how like the religion justifies immorality rather than it being, you know, pushing a supposed moral code. Um, uh, it's, George R. Martin, you know, was was he put a lot of thought into those early short stories. You know, they're 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 very deep and they're very uh, they're very neat. Um, but this is all paying homage to it that. Dahan can do whatever he wants because nobody has a soul except for him and other followers of Bacalon. We don't even meet the other followers of Bacalon. He just does what he wants. Um, so anyway, then, you know, the, uh, as collateral, he, he gives up himself. He could become a slave. And so, but he gets Shalila's dance waiting for him. That's from Karane, Samanthes, which is, he was uh, Stannis' smuggler. Um, so he's, he's making an appearance. So, you know, why not? And, um, you know, Karane Seth Montes is actually a pretty poetic guy in the story. So we had him say something like the king nearly got me burned. I don't fancy be drawn by the Kraken one. He's actually a pretty, pretty colorful, uh, colorful character. And I think he eats snails. We have a plate of snails here. He eats snails with Davos, I think. But they can't go as far as Old Town, so he's like, I can bring you to Starfall. Would but it would have been really interesting, you know, the to think about the what would have happened, you know, Dahan showing up with with like Gilly, like at or even showing up with Mother Mole, you know, and, and meeting Sam, meeting his god. It would have been a very weird moment, right? <laughs> but but of course, you know, not come <laughs> does not come to pass. So then we get to the alchemist, which is of course Malwin, Robert's brother, um, and he is uh, found waiting outside beneath an olive tree. Um, we kind of get this idea that they're among olive groves outside of the city, uh, and so um, Malwin is no alchemist; he's only an apprentice. And this is kind of, <laughs> this is kind of gonna gonna come in later. The only reason, I mean, I guess there's two reasons him being used. Like one, he's going to be cheaper. Um, and the other is that that he's he's Robert's brother. And both of these things do not, like, you know, going with favoritism because of somebody you know and going, going with the cheaper option, um, you're probably going to get what you pay for, <laughs> which is going to come in later. And so he says, oh, you brought the powder. And he says, yes. Uh, he brings it forward and he's got a demon dance, which, you know, was one of just one of the poisons that was that was mentioned in the past and saying that, oh, if we don't in, in small doses, it's, it'll just bring sleep um, because his God had told him never kill over and over um, and, and seven times never kill man. And seven times never kill man, by the way, is um, a line taken from a, uh, a um, the Jungle Book by Ruyard Kipling, um, and it's a um, Ruyard Kipling, um, great writer. But at the same time, he kind of in his writing justified col like colonialism. He kind of saw it as paternalism, you know, like like we're, we're taking care of these these children and we're helping them out, kind of kind of idea. And so his writing in retro his writing today is not. Um, is not uh, is looked as is, uh, is looked at as problematic, and so George R. R. Martin is was highlighting this, and that's why he calls the story on seven time never seven times never kill man. It has a lot to do with wolves, by the way. A lot of the wolf imagery is um, uh, that, that George uses is like definitely definitely like comes kind of comes from the the poem. Um, and so this is this is um. And so I liked this a lot, the, um, the demon dance, the small amounts, the, actually the warning. So he says, I must know the victim's weight within a stone or so to judge. Too little and he's too drowsy, too much and he'll never wake again. What I like about this is it actually is more realistic than most um, 
TV shows or adventures where somebody uses a poison dart or gives somebody some poison or something and they fall asleep. You got to be really careful. I mean, there's an entire profession called anesthesiology that focuses on getting people in that small, narrow band between death and awake. And um, so I really liked how this uses is more realistic than than all the cheap, like, you know, stuff where you just somebody falls asleep or use a poison dart or, you know, chloroform or whatever. Oh, I'm just or you knock somebody out and they just fall asleep. You know, they're just out. No, that's not how knocking somebody out works. But um, so I, I like this. I like this a bit. Um, we find out that the fish wife is the one that's going to tell the tell the weights. So now we have um, that's three of the group, uh, and then oh, revelry. Uh, what some holy night? This is the night that Tregor grew Jar's breath, and then um, and here we find the singer watering his horse, and it is Colio Quinus who was a singer at the. Um, Joffrey's wedding. And in that, the only thing they really said about uh, Coley Aquinas, other than the fact that he dressed loudly, was that he had a ridiculous accent, you know. But, you know, he, Lice, they probably wouldn't think his accent was ridiculous. They just think he was Tairashi, you know. So, um, but in Westeros, they thought his accent was ridiculous. And so we get into uh, Coley Aquinas, and he's like, Who the hell are you? Um, uh, and he says, oh, the Archon of Tyrosh praised my voice as nectar for his ears and outer with a jade comb. The Sea Lord of Bravos once offered a lion snout, snout as payment for my song. There is a line in A Dance with Dragons where Penny says that they perform for the Sea Lord of Bravos, And then she says, and he gave us a, and she hesitates and she says, a great gift. And... Everybody's like, what is that? What does that mean? Is she is she a faceless is she, is she a faceless man? Can she like pick somebody to kill? Like, what would be this great gift? And why wouldn't she be able to tell Tyrion? And so this is kind of an explanation of that line. So the Sea Lord of Bravos offered a lion's snout as payment. And so Penny would feel awkward saying to a noseless Lannister that she was once offered a lion's snout. So she's just like, oh, a great gift. And it's kind of just to deal with that line. Cause like that line is just hanging there. Like, what are we supposed to think? Like it, it's clearly something George, like the like garden thinking, well, maybe, maybe this will be something later. It's not going to be anything later. Like, like why, why would the sea Lord of Bravos be? Sea Lord of Bravos doesn't even like control the the faceless men like what what would he be offering that she would not want to tell Tyrion? it's just so we made this that he offered a lion stout the tour and that's why she didn't want to tell um and then you hear about the golden loot from from the wedding um i do wonder where that golden loot went right because i don't know if they probably gave it out as a prize so they still somewhere this golden loot is just hanging out right <laughs> like somewhere in King's Landing in a in a uh like a storage a storage uh room, this golden loot that that they were supposed to give. Anyway, so this is ha, I was told that Corlos crystal dissolved in sauce did uh that did for Joffrey. Um the reference here is in the prologue of a clash of kings, Crescent describes the strangler. And he says that the, the the alchemists of lice call it something else. He doesn't tell it what it doesn't say what it is, but he says that they call it something else. So Malwin, being studying with the alchemist, would not call it the strangler. So we came up with a name, Corlos Crystal. Corlos is the planet um, on which in which and seven times never kill kill man takes place. So that's why it's Corlos Crystal. And we have it dissolved in sauce. Just as like the, that's the other possibility. Like Joffrey either got killed from the pie with the lemon sauce on top or he got killed from the wine. And so in this situation, like somehow Malwin has heard the theory that it came from the sauce on top of the pie. Um, so Quainus says, uh, I should slay you here now by all she, all, by all means unsheathe your loot and try. Uh, 
Uh, quiet, both of you. Alchemist, the singer, um, won't be a problem. Uh, the, he's the one that's going to get us in because he's so famous. They'll assume he's invited. Um, and so we see his that their plan is a lot like Mance Raider's plan in the north, that they're going to use a singer to gain access to the 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 place for the rescue. So we're getting this parallel now to um, uh, Jane Poole fake Arya's rescue, that they're using a, a singer to get in. Um, but this also calls back, like, how did Sam get the idea? Well, he saw the singer at the at the bar. So all of these little ideas come together, you know. And then he just says, Colio, yeah, I've seen uglier drummers. Uh, so Malwin is just not that good looking. So, so he says, can you at least wear my hat? Draw attention. I think there there used to be another line in there that was like, yeah, he, he did look better. Dahan had to admit, but it, it, it how things flowed, it, it eventually went out. But uh, Mal, the hat does make Malwin look better. So he goes into the um, olive grove and he ties up his his horse so that he can make a getaway because then he's going to go in on the other mule that Malwin brought. Um, and then. They say, okay, well, now they have these, how are they, why would, why would, you know, what gets Malwin and Dahan in? They're going to be drummers, but Traeger's concubine prefers ballads. She loves singers, and so he's just not going to sing any any dances um, so that they can have time to do their thing. You know, not not a bad plan. Um Dahan mounted a second mule, uh, and and then they say they're they're going to go and poison poison the fishwife's wine. And then they come to the 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 gatehouse. They throw a grapnel over the wall. Um, grapnels exist in Ice and Fire. Uh, keep in mind that like Theon uses a grapnel hook to invade Winterfell in a Clash of Kings. So he tosses the grapnel over, and and then they say, oh, and we just get kind of some another little comedy scene he says you know oh hey hey gray nat and he's like gray nat um that was me a week ago i'm brown bat and then i love this guy <laughs> this is all for funny he says neither this one then neither that one then nor this one now knows you so this is the whole thing about like um the the unsullied they always call themselves this one meaning they, they don't have an eye but so they're they're only this one, but then like, what would you call the not yourself in the past? So that would be that one, <laughs> you know. Like, so this is the joke. He's like, neither that one then nor this one that now knows you. State your purpose, which is just kind of like it's kind of making fun of the ridiculousness of the this one premise. Like, oh, this one. Um. He says, ah, Ty, Coley, Aquinas of Tyrosh, being very flamboyant, the singer of tonight's festivities. And, uh, and then they say, ah, you're, you weren't invited. It's like, oh, but you, you know, it's, um, he's, he's leaving tomorrow for Volantis to Han Lied. Um, you wouldn't want him to miss the, the, the best singer in the world. And then they say, Ali of Bravos is the best singer in the world, which is, um, Similar conversation happens with Marillion, uh, and and uh, in a Game of Thrones, he asks Roderick who the best singer in the world is, and or the best singer he's ever heard. And Roderick's like, "Oh, Ali of Bravos," and then <laughs> Marillion gets really angry, and he's like, "That old." And so here, Colio's like, "Alia, no, that ancient wither." And so of course he's going to be offended, in the same way Marillion was. Uh, Marillion was. So then they say, "Well." Maybe, you know, have him sing. And if it's not the most beautiful that you've ever heard, then then they'll leave. Um, and of course, this is all set up like, oh, maybe Colio is is actually being uh, arrogant because he seems like he'd be arrogant. But no, he sings and it's the best. Uh, it's the best they've ever heard. But um, the ballad he sings is the Moors of Carradine. The Moors of Carradine comes from um, uh, the Lonely Song of Lauren Dorr which is a George R. R. Martin story uh, where she mentions the, the Moors of uh, Carradine. Um, it's like a rainbow burning beneath like a starless sky and stuff like this. And so that, that kind of idea of like this starless sky, um, um, 
Maybe I'll, I'll re read the, the part real quick. The Lonely Song of Lauren Dor. Lonely Song of Lauren Dor is, um, it's one of George R. R. Martin's more beautiful tales. Um, it's not exactly, you know, it doesn't have too much of a plot. It doesn't it doesn't really affect Ice and Fire in any way. You're not going to come come away with any like new secrets. It's more fantastical, but it's a very it's a beautiful story. Um, he says, "Have you seen worlds without stars?" And he says, "Yes, many, Lauren." I've seen a universe where the sun is a glowing ember with but a single world and the skies are vast and vacant by night. I've seen the land of the f of frowning jesters where there is no sky and the hissing suns burn below the ocean. I've walked the moors of Carradine and watched dark sorcerers set fire to a rain set fire to a rainbow to light the sunless land. <clears throat> and so this idea of like a <clears throat> how sad it would be <clears throat> to be in this um <clears throat> sunless dying world I, I you know i um and so he sings uh, about this wasteland uh with no no trees for shade no game to hunt um desolate wind spray of ocean where no fish ever swam where the sun goes out and a dying ember and a heap of ash a graveyard for all the stars that have ever shown beneath the black sky one lonely soul no one to love, no light in the, in the dark forever. Um, <clears throat> and so this is, yes, lo the lonely song of Lauren Dorr, but of course it's supposed to also like hark back to the loneliness of Sam. Um, and in many ways, the loneliness of a lot of the characters, like the loneliness of John Vance in the prologue and stuff like that. So then we get to the manse and um, it's in the style of old, old Valyria. So we can kind of get the idea that Ormolin is just this Valyrian lover. Um, it's, uh, got, you know, we just kind of make it's, it's pale white and it's crisscrossed with Valyrian arches and glowing honeycomb. And it has this tangle of red flowered vines coming down. So even though it's Valyrian, it's still white with red flower, you know, it's kind of werewood like, so it's just, you know, that's it. Um, Bubbling Spring, which is going to kind of some some, uh, some setting. Pantera is a, I mean, besides the the, heart, the the metal band from the from the nineties, it is the uh, the one of the gods that they worship in Lice. So of course, uh, Dahan would call it a false god. Um, and then we get a lemon tree, just you know, because um, they cross the light and then we get to uh the cavernous parlor now one of the one of the um submissions had had the party being an orgy so um we dialed it back a little bit but it's practically an orgy i mean it's just people are having sex out in the open but this idea that this is very george r, r. martin to have something be very risque like this and and so um um they walk in and this is what they're they're seeing just naked naked people and nobles just getting drunk and having sex and um and the the gonfalonier is there who who is the the military leader um referenced in fire and blood um a different one but yeah so and then we get you know just some some of the basic politics like him having making peers with uh, peace with mirror like the lice mirror tyrosh wars are always like nonsensical and so going on so it's just kind of there um then we get the capering dwarf girls young and naked Carth taller cartini you know, car car uh, courtesans um and then in the slit in the middle of the floor one slave girl was ravished by four rat-faced dwarves dwarfs um, that's uh, a reference to the the House of the Undying. It's one of the visions that Danny sees, and it's supposed to represent Westeros. But here we just you know we happen to have the physical form of it too, just for the hell of it. And then Alchemist uh, Dahan says, "Lower your eyes, lower your sword." In and seven times never kill man. The worshippers of 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 Bacalon do go around with like erect penises all the time, so. It's kind of like part of the story, George R. R. Martin kind of thing. So, um, 
we just kind of have that for like the upraised sword was a march of mark, uh, mark of strength it just it's just there to make them everybody feel creepy um but he says you know think of your grandmother think of your grandfather of course that's walder Frey as his grandfather so that's the thing he would be thinking of to try to bring his erection down anyway the singer works so they get Lanes. Uh, this is jorah's wife Lanes hightower coming over everybody forms around and so dahan goes to find the uh the fish wife and he's next to a colossal turtle um, mounted by a fierce dragon that's the old man in the sea uh, probably referencing the valyrian conquest of of the roin and defeat of the roinar and so he says who guards the stairwell red dusted wet, wet stick uh, they change their names how many stones do they have dust is 14 um stick is 20 and he's like 20 does he guard the stars by blocking them this is a this is a joke because sam is 20 stone and it's like they're all like just incredulous like how can somebody be 20 stone the joke is is that sam is 20 stone um so uh, so he says i you know especially like these are guards like shouldn't they be like you know walking about or whatever shouldn't like sam in his night night's watch duties like get exercise how does he get to 20 stone but no he it's it's a it's a it's a mystery and then he says okay well and then we get some some reference to um edric storm and he says you know i need the payment tragar's grown weary of harboring the boy um originally we had maybe him giving tribute or something and and other things but it, you know getting into the details is not too important just that like they need the fishwife needed this money and he's not getting it or he's not getting half of it um because uh because dahan lied to him he 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 didn't have the money to pay him all so he just said i'll pay you half and then he was gonna he's gonna jump out just like he wasn't gonna pay back the the rogaris he was fleeing so so he says tomorrow you know tomorrow temple of bacalon you'll have your money then and then he's like yeah you know they might have a problem um but who cares they don't have souls <laughs> so <laughs> which i think is way is i think is much funnier than probably most people the fact that dahan is just like well whatever the person doesn't have a soul um and then he says where is tragar and we have tragar is mad for fortune telling now this is very similar to um hightower um Leighton Hightower is also like obsessed with fortune telling and it's like up up in his room constantly going over things. And so we get this idea that Traegar is doing this too. We find out that Traegar's Traegar's not doing this. Um it just kind of maybe like prophecy like turns him on or something. But or dragons, flaming swords, endless winter is all that prattle. He wanted the wildling girl. And this is the this is the the, the fun stuff about the conflation of Gilly and Mother Mole. She's seen things, knows things, or so he thinks. Like, um, yeah, it might be prophecy, but it also might be like about prophecy. Like Gilly has seen the others. So if he's thinking about prophecy, like Gilly's input would be useful because of what she's seen. Um, but instead it's like, you know, it's actually Mother Mole and her like visions that he was like, oh, she's seen things, you know. Um, Mother Mole's seen the others as well um so he's been filling the ears with omens importance in fact like you know we find out at the end that it's, it's just he brought two of them up there to have a to have a gang bang um on mother mole so it's just it's ridiculous that you're like we're, we're led to believe that they're sitting they're sitting there like looking over prophecy and you know i think originally the line was like they were delving into prophecy but it was a little too much like uh, but they um huddle around whispering prophecies and sides no they're 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 upstairs with a, a gang bang um um and so dahan just doesn't even care about this he's like whatever idol worshippers their dogs barking at the moon hoping to understand heaven um the pale child's word was truth the man's way was his will the 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 truth and the way is from and sometimes never kill man i understand that like some people think oh the way and they instantly like 
think of the um the Mandalorian, but you got to understand that like Taoism, Tao means the way, like the way is a common religious kind of thing, like the truth and the way. These are very common religious kind of terms. So it's, you know, George wrote this story in 1976 about the truth and the way. But people are, a lot of people are like, well, I can't believe you use the way like the Mandalorian. Well, ah, not really. <laughs> is Taoism, is Taoism uh, uh, plagiarizing the Mandalorian? <laughs> um, anyway, then he, um, he gets the wine. Um, and then Malwin is, is over there looking at a Carthine uh, girl, pleasure the Ganfalonier. And uh, again, he's like 20 stone <laughs> by what sorcery? Um, it's funny how in like Lost, they had an entire episode about like how the one character was still fat. Um, Dahan left the alchemist to do his work. I think we walks around the room and then we just kind of get this whole thing about um, setting up that like Dahan um, likes foreign looking women and maybe it's Dahan and maybe it's Sam, but the idea is that there's this like crossing over of Dahan and Sam at this point. Like they, they both have a taste for, for, for wildling, you know, and, and like freckles and things like this. Um, and so uh, while Liness, we also want to establish that Liness does look uh, um, like Sani. You know, we, we hear about that she looks like Daenerys and she's got golden hair and stuff like that. So she's got a Valyrian features to her. So the Han's got to be like, eh, she looks too like Sani. But yeah, he, he, he likes the foreign girls. They were the ones that, that bear the, the bore the strongest whelps. That's also like a, um, an egret kind of kind of belief about about um, siring with people from far away anyway they go back and he says red for red for the big one black for the little he says okay you guys can leave with the singer and Malin's like well aren't they going to notice that we're two not three and he's like yeah you know they'll, they'll change by now change by then completely completely does not care it could even be true for all he knew <laughs> does not, does not care about Melvin and Cor and, and uh and Colio um so who knows who knows at the end of this what happens to Malwin Colio and the fishwife if they if they're going to be caught and dealt with um gives them the the flask to the fishwife and he says okay give me 20 minutes and then you can fill your chamber pot and so then he goes into the privy. We get these just some funny stuff about the, the, the fine porcelain having mythical beasts emptying bowels. And and here we get into Dahan being a badass where he pulls out his rusty sword and then just climbs up the wall and gets out a window. Climbs back in, the, the comes back in when it gets to the second floor. And then his whole plan is that, you know, the West Wing is not so guarded. The East Wing is. So he's going to climb up the West Wing, cross over on the roof, and then come down in order to try to get to the, uh, the uh, to, to Gilly um, uh, and without hurting anybody. So Quiet as a Shadow, reference to, to Arya. And um, and then he, he starts getting this doubt. And this, this all kind of is the influence of like Sam coming in. Like, oh, wait, Red Dust. He was the smaller one, but he's getting the red. He gets the black flask. Black flask. Is, are, is Fishwife going to screw up? And then he peers around the corner, and he finds out that and this is the, some people were confused by this. Um, he finds that the guards are two twins from Nath, about seventeen stone, and both are dead. So <laughs> the point of this is that. The fishwife, first of all, was wrong, okay? He thought the guards were going to be 14 and 20 stone. Two completely different guards were there. So right there, there's a screw up. And then the wine is poisoned for a 14 stone person and a 20 stone person. So one person should be awake and the other person dead, but they're both dead at 17 stone, meaning Malwin also screwed up. So like... <laughs> the the joke here is that they he comes in he finds twins and they're both dead at seventeen stone is that both fishwife and Malwin screwed up their jobs like Malwin was no good at being an alchemist he point like 
he you know he was supposed to be doing something you know giving out the poison for 14 stone person a 17 stone person would still be awake not even not harmed but they're dead so malwin screwed up and then fishwife screwed up so um so he says ah i've disappointed the god oh no well i guess i'll just i've got to get the wildling girl so he climbs up Swift as a deer, crosses over to the parapets, and then he get, then he starts feeling fear, which of course is this is the feelings of Sam coming through and him feeling feeling being Sam. But then he shakes it off. He's no craven, so he makes the jump. Um, and then we're just reminded that he's got his grapnel down there and Pantera. And so then I get to the room, and this is where we get to some really uncomfortable stuff. Um, so yeah, he comes to the room. Three men were in there upon one woman, sweaty, hairy bodies moving up and down grunts and lapping. Um, you know, Tragar Mullen, two other dudes, they weren't looking at prophecy. They were in a gangbang and this just, and the woman is in despair because this is a horrible experience for mother mole. And of course, this is just going to like make Sam just fall apart. You know, he's whimpering and screaming. And so Dahan takes that as he can like feel the anger. He feels Sam. So he's like, I know what Bacalon wants. He wants me to kill them all. And so the Bravo runs in and just sorts of like, you know, starts slaughtering everybody. And we're not sure if this is, it's left ambiguous if this is Sam's like purpose. It's what Sam wanted. And maybe Sam wants it deep down, but you know, regular Sam would never want this, but they're connected on a certain level. And so Dahan is feeling what Sam wants on this sort of like deep, deep level, this, you know, uncontrolled rage level. So Dahan runs over, sl- you know, slashes everybody up. He, just as he promised in the beginning, he cuts open Traegar's throat. He, he he puts guts on the, uh, on the carpet. So the carpets are, or dyed red. Um, but one of the, uh, one guy gets out of the room and then another another guard at the end of the room like sees him. So he's like, oh crap, it's, it's done. So what is he going to do? And he says, oh, do you speak the common tongue? And she says, yes. And uh, um, the pale child Bacalon uh, smiles on you. What What's your name? It's Mole. It's, it's revealed that it's Mother Mole the whole time. It's not Gilly. Um, and so has this joke, a lovely name, <laughs> you know, um, Bacalon began speaking in tongues, like just Sam is just shutting down. He just doesn't know what to do. Everybody's dying. It's not even Gilly. Um, they're coming after him. He's, Sam is just sitting there going, not Gilly, not Gilly. And then Dahan is like, okay, this is my final test of faith. Um, my God will protect me because I've done everything correct. Uh, Bacalon fashioned our bodies from steel. That's actually, that line is actually from, and seven times never kill man. That Bacalon fashions bodies from steel. This is the truth and the way. And he met her eyes. They're hazel, like, um, this mirror red wine. She was truly beautiful referencing back the fact that like Sam thought this mirror red wine was beautiful. Yeah, so, um, Dahan Pedrato smiled softly, sputters and gas poured from the child's mouth. I feel strong with you. And he jumped. Um, and then he says, don't tell the cry the child too late. And she tried to free herself and they're dragged into open air. This is, of course, very similar to Theon jumping with, with Jane Poole, what they did at the end of their somewhat botched escape mission but uh in this case um dahan and mother mole uh probably probably didn't have the luck of uh of theon there is some there is some discussion that you know there that perhaps they could land in the fountain um in in um pantera's fountain but I don't know if there's enough water in the fountain to like save them. 
Because, like, if they're, like, four stories up, even if it were, like, a, a 10-foot pool, you'd have some problems, you know? So, um, so it's probably, probably, probably the end for them. Um, but, you know, a little ambiguity with the fountain. But, yeah. And then, um, long legs away, the fat boy just watches the earth rush up to meet them. This is always how George describes, like, people falling, the earth rushing up to, to meet them. Um, certainly how, how, uh, um, Bran is described when he falls from his tower or from Pate on uh, the cobblestones in, in the prologue of A Feast for Crows. And then Sam opened his mouth, but it only filled up with blood and not the bath. So he's just tasting blood again. And he's reminded of the bath. And so he's like stuck in that hell again of, of, uh, of the bath. And that's how we, we end the, we end the story in this uh, very tragic, very tragic ending. <clears throat> Oh, oh, Samwell. Oh, Samwell. Well, that's, um, that's part two. Uh, I th hope, uh, I'm not sure if I, if I, if I think of things I miss, I'll, 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 I'll post them in the description. But other, other than that, I think I got everything. I, I think this, the second part's pretty, pretty fun. Um, even if it's tragic and horrible, it's meant to make you feel uncomfortable. Um, and, uh, um, but nonetheless, uh, using using all of the different characters that that exist in lice um as as many as possible to uh to create a story anyway thank you all and we'll uh see you guys next time